So good evening to everyone. I appreciate that uh, on Friday at four, you are all here to discuss in a quite light topic like novel concept and digital states and the structure that uh, is uh, a good topic in order to close uh, our discussion. And uh, before starting, uh, just a quick uh, introduction also because in the picture that were before, Vangelis and I were almost uh, during our student periods, <laughs> and that's, so you may have some confusion about the people that are around the table. <laughs> so uh, we have uh, four uh, speakers. On my left, uh, Indra Speaker uh, from University of Frankfurt, Dara uh, Halian from Fitzcrams School, uh, sorry, but uh, I'm Italian in German. <laughs> and uh, Vangelis Papa Costantino from Vier University in Brussels, and Laura Ferreira from University of Brasilia and the Goethe Institute, uh, Goethe University. I don't add more to the biography because we are all online in different accounts according to each preferences uh, and also in uh, the CPDP uh, uh, web page. Uh, the topic is quite challenging also for the moderator. And uh, I appreciate uh, in uh, the topic the reference to the post-Westphalian order. And so the post-Westphalian order is uh, the change that we have after the peace in Westphalia between the previous order that was based on a big, you can say, institution, so the Catholic Church and the Empire, and a state, modern state context that was uh, created uh, or during the uh, 16th century. And uh, this idea was that there are no authority outside of the state. So the state is the main reference for the authority. In the post westphalian order, uh, the focus is about the fact that this idea to have the authority in the hand of the state have to deal with a different framework that recognizes an important role of international bodies, uh, like uh, United Nations, Council of Europe, and many others. So what is this three-layer notion, pre-Westphalia, Westphalia, and post-Westphalia, applied to the digital context? Uh, I think that in the panel we address these different topics, but just to to share some initial uh, idea to start the discussion, uh, I think that first, the Westphalian order that was based on nation now, of course, is challenged since many years, we can so say, due to the fact that the internet is not national base. But at the same time, we have some kinds of balkanization, so called. Uh, new regionalism approach, for instance, Russia, China, and other countries that like to have a sort of a protected garden. And uh, of course, this is a sort of reaction, if you want uh, to have a new kind of national control. On the other hand, we have this in the post westalia approach, the role of international bodies. But if you look at the digital context, we have to admit that these international bodies are not so strong. The Council of Europe had adopted information one away, one away plus, OK. But United Nations, many different uh, initiatives. But at the end, it is not so strong. So who is the power that is strong in the game? And the power that is strong in the game is the power of the big players. The big players that create their own region, their own state with their own rules. Digital ecosystem that are ruled by private companies for those that enter in this area, like a gatekeepers. So in this sense, this is a, a limitation to the state power that comes from private entities. Before the limitation from the state power comes from high level institution like Catholic Church and Empire, then comes from a decision of the state to limit his power and to share this power with international body like the European Union or other international body. Now is something that the state passively receive from outside, from big players, from big platform that fix the rules and the state 
have to deal with this. So I think this is an initial uh, sharing of idea about this post westphalian order in the digital uh, states. And I think along this line, of course, there's a huge debate, for instance, in digital constitutionalism, but also in the field of uh, social and technology regulation. So I think that the, the, the panel will be very rich. And I will not add any more words and leave the floor to Indra. Thank you. Thanks a lot, and I really appreciate that you'd like to spend your afternoon here with us in this room, despite all the possibilities in Brussels. And I did try to get champagne here, but um, they wouldn't let me downstairs take it up here. Really sorry about this. So I'll try to make it as interesting as possible and um, share some of the thoughts that I have about what is the modern state and modern power regulation all about. Um, if we're and I'd like to, to really think on what is the effects on democracy, because I think that is one of the most challenging uh, questions that we have to pose, and that's exactly the question. If we have private power, which is more powerful than state power, then democracy is basically not really necessary anymore, because it's not the mere power with the state that needs to be balanced and regulated, but then it's private power. And maybe we need the state for that, but that's just a thought. I'd like to start, I'm a privacy law professor at Frankfurt, and therefore you won't find me on LinkedIn or anything like this. You would really have to do a start page search and then you'll find me. Um, I, I teach data protection, privacy. Um, and one of the things I always teach is data protection is a backbone of democracy. Because if we don't have data privacy, if we don't have protection of the individual, then we don't have autonomy, we don't have freedom, and we don't have the requisites to modern control of state power. And I would like to enlarge it, and I do so in my um, lectures now, that I say, and we don't have control of private power either. But I would like to start from a different standpoint, not from the legal standpoint, but rather from the effects of the site. And that is what we're looking at, and when we're talking, and we had so many panels here on AI, be it in the title or be it just on the, po on the podium here, um, AI is just basically, to me, um, the present end point of something that started with big data, with data mining, with personification, with personalization and dynamization of categorization and um, all sorts of relationships. And you can add on, and there was, as far as I saw, only one panel. If you think about quantum computers, then this is going to be the next generation of problems that connected with all of those technology stuff um, is going to challenge us. We talked here on many of the panels on the surveillance state. That's the obvious thing. The less obvious is that we will have the positive side of it, and that is what's sometimes called the one-stop state. That's a wonderful, caring state. Um, you buy a house, and the next day you get in the mail, and of course it's your email or through Twitter or whatever, you get a permit to rebuild that house because the state already knows that you're not going to let this dump from the 1960s be a dump, but you want to have it restyled to at least nine, uh, 2023 standard, if not advanced more. You can also think about this, you give, most of you are still in the age where that is an issue, um, you have a child. And you get congratulations from the state. Um, here's the school your child will go to, and this is the university and the subject that it will study. Because thanks to data mining, thanks to AI, et cetera, et cetera, we know what the chances are of this child becoming a lawyer, God beware, or becoming someone who's doing electricity or a social engineer or whatever. And that's the point where it starts to get a bit creepy. The permit thing sounds like the perfect digitalized state who is service oriented, who does everything for us, so there's low barriers, etc. Low barriers also means control on the side of the state of distribution of permits, of allowing people, and basically even of guiding people. And that is kind of a rather scary thought. Now, what can we, in this type of a state, the one-stop state, if you so want, what can we identify are the real troubles that we have here? Um, we can look at it, and I said that's my, my major point today, on the side of democracy. Now, what's democracy about? Democracy has tons of definitions, tons of functions, and there have been much smarter people thinking about this for much longer than I have. But I would just like to point out there are a couple of characteristics. One of them is democracy enables participation in power. 
it is maybe um, a very homeopathic approach in a certain sense, but still there is participation. Secondly, and that's what's often forgot, democ democracy is minority representation. It doesn't say minority ruling, but it says minority representation. And that is what fundamental rights are for, so that it's not the majority ruling everything, but the minority being protected to a certain extent. It's also a choice of people and personnel. We see that with the commission. Um, whenever there's a new parliament, um, whenever there are new elections, there will be new commission, there will be new people, there will be new agendas coming up. And we have time as a factor. Democracy is power for a certain amount of time. And that is something that is often forgot. With AI, we don't have those breaks anymore, a stop and start afresh, but we have continuous and always ongoing judgments according to the past as a linear structure. Of course, this is all simplified and you may easily contradict. Now, what does that mean to our legal system and to the understanding we have of a state? Let's start with the sovereign, the citizens. All of a sudden, we don't have a human essence of dignity anymore in this kind of a service-oriented one-stop state. And the surveillance part is something you always have to keep running in the back of your mind. Um, freedom is, and again, a lot of people have thought about freedom, and this is much more uh, complex than I'm presenting it here now. Freedom is choice. It's taking risks. It's even sometimes the risks coming true and life being bad. It's about suffering from your decisions. It's also, of course, that's the promise in democracy and in freedom that you have the gains, that the chances come true, etc but it's always linked to decisions that we as lawyers frame and the neuro neurologists all to tell us that this is different, but that it is something which happens at the spur of the moment, maybe with deliberation or not, which represents us and our inner self. Well, if we're orchestrated by the state, there is not much left. And the question is <laughs> who orchestrates us and which are the normative values behind that? The easy thing about freedom is that it basically just says, I don't know what you like. You like whatever you like. We are not involved in that. And that stops with the permit which tells you what type of house you want, the, the letter that informs you which school your child will go to, etc. The other problem that arises is exactly what Alessandro um, pointed out, and that's the public-private partnership problem. All of a sudden, the state is dependent on the privates. I'm not going to delve into this, and I think some one else here on the panel might or on the discussion. Then um, we need to discuss the right to act wrongly. It's something which we forget. Um, the idea is always optimize, make things better. Well, freedom is also to do stupid things. And a lot of people who don't adhere to data privacy are stupid and there's the freedom to do so and that's good as it is. There's also the freedom to do something wrong. Um, you can actually kill someone if you want, can, right? I'm talking about the ability. We don't because we've been educated because they are very, very strong forces that um, from a social and a legal point of view hold us back. But it's not the type of, um, okay, you might kill someone so let's take you out of the race. That type of thing is something that needs to be discussed. And something which is often forgotten is the relation to the past. Like I said, democracy is about starting afresh to a certain point. When you come here, you might be a different person than you are in your company. Um, when you go to a party, you're a different person than if you go to the birthday party of your boss or at the school or at the soccer team or whatever. This role changing aspect all stops if you're totally relying on past data, which is known and evaluated consistently to make a consistent picture of yourself. We like to think at least of ourselves as being not so consistent. What does that have to do with the state? A lot, um, because the convenience state, as I want to call it, is basically taking away all of that, which in my opinion, and maybe I'm on the sunny side of life, and that's why I think that way, makes life interesting, fun, and wants me to procrastinate, and spend time here, and be here, and do things, and think about things, etc. All of that is taking away. And that's where psychology needs to come in because a lot of times this does something with the human mind, the human body, the human spirit, the human soul, if you so want. The state is not something to cover all of that, but the state is something to enable that to take place. And the super, super convenient store of the state idea is really counteracting that. 
So what do we really need? Um, or what do we have to look for? And I'd like to offer at least some thoughts on a solution. The one thing is we have to think of any type of IT as a tool and we have to make sure it remains a tool. So a lot of these things might not be as comfortable anymore and as hidden and it will not be just the click which answers all of this, but that is a necessity on to, to, to answer those questions. The second is, we have to keep deliberate room for surprises. And for those of you who are academics, um, we have very little room for experimental stuff. We have peer reviewed, which means nothing else but that people who have worked in a particular field say this is good or not because it relates to something that has already been done. So we're advancing little bit by little. We need room for surprises, for true innovation, for doing something totally different, stupid, out of the fray. And in order to do that, we need to frame rooms in which people are separated and are not compared to the same people, person, role, whatever, and different. That is something that we need to think about. We do that very infrequently because law usually looks at different angles um, and, and just takes that, assumes that, but it is threatened by the new developments. The third thing is that we need to decide and that is part of the tool thing, the toolbox. Where do we want to perpetuate the past? Where do we gain and win if we just do what has been done again and again? Where do we want the state basically to be a service, a convenient um, provider of services? And where do we not want that, deliberately not want it? And the fourth point is that we don't like to think of law and the state as a provider of room for conflict, but that is really something the state does presently. And the Westphalian piece uh, is really an example of that to a certain extent, because there um, it was agreed that there was a particular way of dealing with those huge problems taking place. And this enabled after that to have trust building to have trust evolving and basically overcome the terrible effects of this war, which was worse than anything the world had seen until then, really. And this is something which we need to strengthen, that the state is not there to basically create one world for all, but rather to create a framework in which conflict can take place, in which differentiation can take place, where people can have different opinions, different sorts of understanding of freedom and enact their individuality. And I know that this is sort of on a very, very high panel now that I'm talking, a very, sorry, panel level that I'm talking. But the idea behind it is we're talking so much about concise instruments, et cetera, et cetera, and the inability to do something that we need to think sort of on a level above that. We're not going to stop AI from being a black box. We're not going to stop AI. Think of AI in 10 years time, right? Um, we will not be able to control for what has happened in this long duration because we cannot have the alternative AI just running next to the real AI or something like this. So what we need to do is basically use AI for where it is useful and restrict it where we don't want the effects. And that is taking place on a different level. And I've just tried to illustrate that a little bit on the state level. Thank you very much. Thank you, Indra, and also thank you to squeeze everything in only 12 minutes. And <laughs> that is not exactly the, the right time for this kind of topic. <laughs> but uh, without uh, any uh, further comment, just to, to make possible to have a discussion, then I leave the floor to Dara. Thank you. Thank you, Alessandra. Um, so the title has this word, novel concepts in it, which is quite provocative. So I thought I'd try and come up with a novel concept. Um, so essentially, with that in mind, this presentation will focus on the changes in legal systems that emerge as a result of information processing technology. So not necessarily on the changes in legal substance, but in legal structures. And in that regard, what I'm going to do is talk very specifically about the potential for the emergence of a new form of fundamental right, which sits in between an underlying set of substantive fundamental rights and their social context. <clears throat> so ideally, law and society have this symbiotic relationship. Law provides a set of norms which serve to structure social behavior, which serve to reduce uncertainty. 
and society provides sort of the substrate on top of which you can build these norms and in relation to which these norms can make sense at all. Over time, of course, you have changes in law, you have changes in society, so you can't just have a static relationship. What you really need is a dynamic, reflexive relationship, otherwise you lose this symbiosis. Now that dynamic, reflexive relationship, that doesn't emerge sort of naturally from assessive substantive principles. It's actually maintained and tended to by specific mechanisms. So we all know these mechanisms. One example is legislation, another is case law. What they do is they serve the possibility for a bilateral flow of information from social context into law, the other way around, as well as a processing of this information within the legal system and then a subsequent editing of the principles and provisions you find in law. So removal of unnecessary provisions, addition of necessary provisions, and interpretations of existing provisions so that they match to the needs of their social context. Um, but these mechanisms, they all have limitations. There's an only so much adaptability they provide in relation to a legal system. You can think, for example, in any given jurisdiction, if you look at the court system, there's only so many cases that are going to be heard on topic X, Y, or Z, so many decisions that are going to be brought forward, and so many potentials to adapt existing law in one way or the other. And that's those, ca those courts which are capable of you know, providing jurisprudence in the true sense or in the sense of stare decisis. What you have then is in phases of significant social change, accelerated social change, <clears throat> on the one hand, you're going to have the, a heightened need for the legal system to adapt, but on the other hand, you're going to have a heightened likelihood that these adaptation mechanisms are going to reach their limits and are not going to provide the relevant and requisite <coughs> adaptations. Excuse me. So when we think of information processing technologies, think of this exponential expansion in possibilities to forge connections between people, to generate and tend to knowledge to serve existing and then emergent aims, possibility to forge new structures, and um, in relation to social context, this, this breeds this sort of image of a society in a period of significant change. In a relatively short period of time, um, we see a society that has apparently become considerably more complex, considerably more flexible, considerably more uncertain in a lot of ways. We don't know precisely where many of these technologies are going to take us and how they're going to combine to form new concepts, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, we, from a normative perspective, we don't always know what to precisely do with them. And we like to think we do often, but mostly we don't. Um, and in that regard, I think you can put forward, I'd like to put forward a, a relatively speculative, but I think reasonable enough hypothesis. And that is that uh, in relation to areas of law which are touched by information processing, you're likely to see the emergence of new legal structures which serve to compensate for the fact that existing structures of adaptation are not going to fulfill, you know, can't fulfill the requirements that society sort of putting forward for adaptation in law. Fundamental rights is a very special form of law. So uh, we treat it in a very special way, give it a certain form of reference, uh, um, reverence, excuse me. Uh, it occupies a very special position in our legal system, but it is at base still describable as simply one legal system, one form of legal system or legal subsystem if you want. And in that regard, fundamental rights don't enjoy some special immunity for the need for a reflexive dynamic relationship between them and their fundamental uh, and their social context. And this raises in relation to the hypothesis that I just put forward, a nice interesting subsequent question, which is what kind of novel adaptations in legal structure might we see in relation to fundamental rights if we accept the premise that fundamental rights are going to be impacted or we see an impact on fundamental rights via information processing? Now, one direction you can take that thought is the idea of the emergence of a new form of fundamental right, which essentially serves to sit between the underlying set of substantive fundamental rights and social context, which essentially serves an interface function between these two things. You might call that an interface right. And you can go a little bit deeper on the basis of this basic proposition. You can start to even build uh, a picture of what 
interface bytes might look like, a picture of characteristics they might have, sort of an ideal typical picture of an interface right in the first instance at the very top level. What you're gonna find is a write that really doesn't make substantive or, or makes only very shallow substantive commitments for its normative orientation. It's going to point back to the underlying fundamental rights that it, it essentially tries to, tries to assist transposition into social context. You can go a bit deeper, and then in terms of you know, more substantive provisions or, or parts of these fundamental rights, you're going to find provisions which essentially can be described in terms of an interface function. So you're going to find provisions which serve to break down complex social processes into more normatively digestible form. You're going to find provisions which um, serve to extend the, the, the contact area between law and society, so extend decision-making frameworks so that fundamental rights can be taken into account at a higher degree of granularity. You're going to find provisions that bump up the capacity of the legal system itself to engage with social processes at a higher degree of granularity and then revisit those engagements um, on the basis of new information or on the basis of subsequent change in social context. Um, so... That was, at a very, very abstract, speculative level, this presentation of what an interface right might be. And the obvious question, so I'm pretty sure a lot of you are asking, is why should anybody care? You can speculate in a million different directions about developments in law, and unless they have these speculations have some relevance to the real world or what we do, then maybe they're not so useful. Um, the response is essentially, I think, actually, this concept has utility. It can be used to describe certain developments we see in modern law. And I would offer the example of data protection uh, in this regard. So we seem, or it seems to me, that we have a difficulty in data protection in coming up with concepts on which you can build a holistic description of the area of law, what it is, what it does, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I think the concept of an interface right might fit the bill quite well in that regard. So as a very, very basic theoretical proposition on data protection law building on the concept of interface right, you have, you could say, well, the right to data protection is an interface right. That fits quite well with what you see in Article 8. Um, you see a right which itself actually does seem to make relatively shallow normative commitments and does point to the underlying set of fundamental rights uh, to provide it with its normative orientation. You do find a right which seems to consist of provisions you can describe in terms of their interface function. So, for example, provision on supervisory authorities, okay? essentially a possibility to bump up the capacity of the legal system to interface with social processes. And then on top of this very basic fundamental theoretical proposition, you can add a subsequent proposition about secondary EU data protection laws. You can say, well, secondary EU data protection law constitutes a representation in secondary law of the unfolding of an underlying interface, right? And again, if you look at secondary EU data protection law, this is a plausible description, I think. Uh, look at the GDPR, look at its goal. Its goal points directly to the protection of other rights and freedoms. Um, and you look at its substantive provisions. Uh, again, the majority of these, I think, can be quite nicely described in terms of performing some kind of an interface function. So, Consider, for example, a uh, purpose limitation principle. Uh, essentially, it functions to break down complex social processes into normatively digestible chunks. Um, so with that, I would wrap it up and uh, pass the floor back to Alessandra. Great. So three minutes, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I, 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 I have some comments and consideration about the first two presentations, but I prefer to finish all the presentations so then we have a discussion also with the audience that uh, attend uh, the meeting. So uh, we go on in our uh, brainstorming about this topic and we move uh, to Vangelis. Thank you. Thank you, Alessandro. Yes, you, you are right. We are not making it any easier for the audience because it is brainstorming and it's on different topics, but it is intentionally so. It is a philosophical panel at the end of the day. And, uh, but the, the whole conference is about ideas that drive our digital world, so you get some ideas uh, about that. And uh, yeah, as far as I'm concerned, I'm going to use my 10 minutes in order to present uh, to you a state theory, more or less perhaps new uh, in a way in its uh, premises. 
So bear with me for 10 minutes while I explain uh, the theory of uh, states as platforms. And let me, <clears throat> let me please begin uh, by stating that platforms by now have uh, a definition in EU law. So it is uh, informational structures that store and disseminate information by their users. And uh, my first point is that uh, states have done this in the real world forever. And uh, in fact, this is why states exist. So let us go back in, uh, in the digital world and uh, as back as we can in our minds. Uh, why do states exist at all? Why do organized societies exist at all? This is an old question. Uh, most of you, most of the theory would reply for security reasons, in order to give security to the individual, because as Hobbes said, uh, life uh, outside the state would uh, be short, brutish, nasty, you know, things like that, horrible things. So horrible things happen, therefore we have a state. There are other theories out there, a theory about justice, principle of justice, a theory about uh, accomplishment of big projects that would otherwise be... I, I will stick with the security theory because I think it's the best. Uh, but my point here is that there is another mission that comes even before that. There is another role of the state that comes before that. And this is the informational uh, intermediary or in other words, a trusted third party. So let me make this clear. As soon as anybody's born, a human being is born, and in order to get any meaningful life, he or she gets a name and a nationality. This has been forever like that. And in order for me to make a meaningful discussion with Alessandro, there, is, there are states above us. There is the Italian state that warrants to me that Alessandro is who he claims to be and uh, can discuss here with me, I am who I claim to be, and uh, we can have a meaningful transaction or a meaningful communication. Without that, without a third party above us warranting, giving the name and warranting name and nationality, we would not exist. And please, nationality, don't take it in this modern contemporary uh, meaning. Take it as even in the first societies, in kingdoms or empires. Or, therefore, the first and foremost role of a state is not to provide security or to pursuit of justice or whatever else. It is to be an informational intermediary, a trusted third party for anybody, because otherwise we would not exist. We could not have the life of human beings. We would have the life of animals. So this is the primary role of the state. Once this is done, when it's one of us has a name and a nationality, then security comes in, because then the state knows, or we know within the state, who to protect against whom, then we know who to be just towards or whatever else. So the first and primary role of a state is not security or whatever else, it is information, an information broker, an intermediary. And this of course continues with our life. We go, we study, we, uh, we have a family, we, we live on. Each time comes the state validating, ratifying, providing this information to any third party we wish. So if we want to move to another country, we come with our degrees, with our, uh, the whole package, then if we wish to transact within the same country, it is always the state that warrants the information necessary to transact. So my first point is that states, first and foremost and primary role before anything else comes to the fore is information, information brokerage. And this has come to the fore now that we have in the past, it was not so. I will explain, explain why in a minute. It was not so visible to uh, thinkers of the past. It has become visible now because of the information revolution. But so let us put a full stop there as regards the state. And then the second point regards individuals. So us, it's one of us. So why are we here? What do we want? What do we, do? What do we aim at? Why do we exist? So the idea here is that we are on this planet and what we want out of our life each one of us is to maximize our information processing. Simply that. Human beings are on this planet to maximize their information processing. Because everything in life is information processing. And this too has become visible after the information revolution. Because even in uh, agricultural societies, when you were born, uh, people learned to cultivate, the, so they increase their informational processing. When you have a family, you increase your informational processing. 
when you have new experiences, you increase your informational processing. People who like money in their life, they do not like money in their life because they want to touch gold. They want money in their life because of the experience that money gives, so informational processing. Same, of course, with us academics pursuit, uh, in the pursuit of knowledge, again, information processing. So what individuals actually do is information processing, and this is their sole and main aim in life, regardless of the particulars of how this becomes very concrete in circumstances, but still what the pursuit of happiness is the pursuit of maximization of information processing. So that was the second point. So if you bring these two together, you have the state and necessary third party providing, making information processing possible, and individuals wanting to process information. So the two have been in harmony for uh, several thousands of years, but now, what has implicitly taken place all these years is that the state controlled the information flows because humans did not move that much. And there was no digitization of information too. So humans over history did move around, moved around very little, but whenever they moved around, so even for us, if we relocate from Italy, for example, to Belgium, then our whole circumstances, we move to a different state. So another state takes over. So it's another state performing the information processing. Um, even if it is uh, a state occupying another state, still there is continuity in states. So each time in human history, there was a state in charge because individuals locally belong to a state and the state controlled the information flow. Each time an individual from a given state had to transact with another state, it had to, to pass through customs, borders, uh, taxes, uh, passports, visas, you name it. It's always state control. So this is the model that we operate, that information by individuals are controlled by their states. This, how, this is how we operated for thousands of years. But this now has broken because of the online platforms, individual, private, private online platforms. And suddenly, we can uh, reside located anywhere in Belgium and transact with third parties, participate in communities, be informed without the Belgian state participating in this exchange. This is unprecedented in human history. Always the state had been the third party validating and monitoring the information exchange. But now, through this digitization of information and in the private online platforms, the model has broken. And this creates challenges. And I'll stop here because we have too much information already. Pass the floor back to you and we can discuss more. This is a great panel. I never have a panel in which there is a self constraint like this one. I, I really appreciate it. As a moderator, it's a great. I have several comments also for you, but after. Okay, fine. <laughs> and, uh, and so to the, to the last speaker, to, to Laura, and then uh, uh, some comments, and then the audience. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm good. Ah, at least that's my presentation. So good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for the invitation. I'm. Ah, do I have this? The pointer. Yes, the pointer. Ah, okay. Thank you so much. Okay. I'm Laura Scherto, and I'm a professor in Brazil. I am currently in Frankfurt as a postdoctoral researcher at the Goethe University. And in a context in which there is a growing debate on regulating AI, Brazil is also dealing with this issue. The Brazilian Federal Senate established a legal experts commission last year to support the regulation of artificial intelligence in the country. I was the rapporteur of this commission, which presented a draft bill. Early this month, the president of the Senate introduced this draft formally, which then became Bill 2338. By coincidence, also this month, the European Parliament reached an agreement on a version of the AI Act, which has interesting uh, changes. I would like to give an overview of these processes, analyzing the tensions regarding the regulatory strategies applicable by the state. AI systems pose many risks to the democratic legal order by reinforcing social inequality and discrimination, amplifying the problem of the asymmetries and the concentration of power by companies, 
intensifying manipulation of information and the spread of disinformation. As Indra and Alessandro already told us, it is above all a matter of power, economic power, data power, and also predictive power. Can the state limit this power through adequate regulation? Which kind of regulatory strategies are used in these bills? Do we need novel instruments or are classical strategies such as command and control and substantial regulation still useful? These are some of the questions I would like to address. Ah, sorry. <laughs> These are the regulations. So the, the Brazilian one and the AI Act. I would like to start highlighting the different strategies that the currently regulation proposals on AI are implementing, such as the AI Act and also the Brazilian AI Bill. And I'm going to focus on three main dichotomies, such as command and control versus responsive regulation, or also called smart regulation, a risk-based approach versus a rights-based approach, and a procedure, uh, uh, an approach that uses more procedural norms versus uh, substantial norms. When we look to the first dichotomy, command and control versus smart regulation, I would say that the AI Act uses much more a smart regulation framework. So we are used, I maybe I can, we you can see in the Act many articles and many instruments like the regulatory sandboxes, impact assessment, uh, social impact assessment, and codes of conduct. But there is, there is also, and I'm going to go back to this article, in Article 5, we can see that uh, this act uses also or applies also a kind of command and control when, he, when it prohibits some uh, uses or some practices of artificial intelligence. And I highlighted the three novel uh, prohibitions that the parliament uh, established in this last version. Now coming to another dichotomy, and now the dichotomy that enshrines risk-based approach versus rights-based approach, um, I would say that even though the premise of the AI Act is one of a risk-based approach, a number of organizations have argued that it should establish also rights, and it should uh, maybe change a little bit its approach to a more rights-based approach. And indeed, in the latest version agreed in the EU, EU Parliament, these claims were taken into consideration, I would say, uh, which is evident in this new Article 68, which provides for a right to explanation. But, uh, and, and in this sense, I would like to highlight too that the Brazilian AI Bill, uh, it provides also for some rights and these are right, the right to receive prior information regarding interaction with, with AI systems, a right uh, to explanation, a right to challenge decisions that produce legal effects, a uh, right to human determination, a right to non-discrimination, and a right to privacy and personal data protection. As we see in Brazil, we, as, we, as you can see, we try to combine both approaches. So we uh, have indeed uh, a risk-based approach, uh, and we have like a list um, classifying the, I would say the most, or the high risks um, practices, but we have also this um, risk-based, uh, also these uh, rights to the affected people, or for, uh, rights from for the affected people. And moving to our uh, third dichotomy, uh, I would say, and this is the procedural norms versus substantial norms, uh, I would say that it's clear that the AI Act provides for many procedural norms, such as the one we can see in Article 16. These are the obligations of providers of high risk AI systems. So we, see, we can see many obligations, uh, such as documentation, such as notification, 
And these are much more procedural norms than substantial norms. But what I would like to highlight, and I think that's uh, something also new in this debate, and it's coming right now, is that we can see uh, that even though the AI Act provides mostly for these procedural norms, there is a growing debate for a more substantial approach when it comes to automated decisions and inferences. And I just want to highlight some of these uh, new research, such as the book uh, Vulner Vulnerability uh, from, uh, in the Data Protection Law uh, from uh, Professor Mojiedi, this, this uh, article from Sandra Varta, uh, A Right to Reasonable Inferences, Rethinking Data Protection Law in the Age of Big Data, and this article from Dennis Hirsch. I think it's very interesting to think, uh, especially because we are thinking here about what is novel and what is uh, classic or what is already old. And as a private law uh, scholar and professor, I am very interested in this process uh, that we can see, especially that it's, it's described by Professor Canaris as the materialization of private law. And in some sense, uh, and this process uh, he describes as, um, I would say, as maybe the, the consumer protection code is the, the, the concretization of this materialization. But of course, we have much more uh, other, we have other examples of this kind of materialization. And I think that's interesting to think, uh, are we going to stay with procedural norms? Are they going to be... Um, the majority of our norms, or are we going really, is there also a tendency um, regarding more substantial norms, or as Professor Canali said, as a tendency of materialization? So that's one more question I'm going to pose, and I, th I, I already noticed that we have so, so many questions here in this panel. So uh, maybe regarding all of these strategies, uh, you can see that the emergence of new regulatory strategies clashes with uh, classical tools, which in turn create a merge between novel and existing approaches. There is also, uh, regardless of all these uh, controversies, there is some common ground for regulating AI, which is the regulation shouldn't be too prescriptive, it needs to be adaptable, there is a dialogue and there should be a dialogue between horizontal and sectoral approach and tort law complements regulation. There is also a consensus regarding the urgency of such a regulation. We have to get it right, but we also have to get it fast, as Professor Andrea Henda always says. So thank you very much, and I'm looking forward to the debate. Thank you very much to all of you and uh, also for the different angles that you provided to this quite broad uh, discussion, we can say. I take some note. Uh, I'm a bit confused, but uh, that's, that's okay. Uh, the, the idea, um, I think there are two blocks. Uh, one block is context and the other block is uh, answer, as usual. Uh, in terms of context, uh, um, we have the risk of a state that can be invasive, can be predictive, etc. But we have, as said by, by Vagelis, we have also the risk of uh, the sort of disruption of the traditional state function. So I, I think that um, these two elements are part of the context. Uh, of course, you can imagine that the, the state is the traditional state that to provide the services, welfare state, or whatever you want, but with that new technology layer that, of course, can be very, increase a lot of, limit, create a lot of limitation in terms of freedoms and in terms of dignity, I think, that is a very crucial point. And so freedom, dignity, these are the main uh, pillars of the tradition in the, uh, low regulation with regard to digital technology, we can say. Um, 
On the other hand, there is the disruption. So the, the role of uh, the private uh, entities uh, that to a certain extent uh, create uh, in the middle uh, um, mediation uh, between the role of the state and the role of the person. Um, I, I'm a bit uh, more optimistic <laughs> because uh, uh, you, Vagelis, uh, adopt uh, an approach that remember me, the, the Floridi approach uh, in info, info.org, uh, uh, we are all information, etc. I'm a bit traditional. I think that we are much more than information only. And uh, I think that... Uh, uh, and this is also part of the, 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 the reflection. Um, so my concern is also that this is a, a, an interpretation that can lead to a sort of datification of individuals. And uh, I'm not so in favor about that. So saying that we are information is also limiting our identity as human being, impact on our dignity, etc. I think that we are much more than information. And I think that the information are used for goals, but are not uh, per se the end, are only a means. So, um, and uh, then we have the, the, the part in terms of answer. Of course, uh, you all focus on answers, fundamental principle, we can say, in terms of fundamental rights, dignity, and uh, solution more related to the enabling rights. You don't use enabling rights, you say interface rights, it recalled me enabling rights in Denmark's data protection. So, but of course, the role that we have to create rights that per se are not focused on the specific goal, but make possible to create a sort of reaction, a systemic reaction like data protection that enable many different kind of, of reaction. And this to face the devolution of the society and the technology, of course. And, and also Laura, in our presentation dealing with the AI, that is a typical topic in which we have to face and try new issues. And for this reason, we try also to figure out a new, new rights or new answer. But based on all this brainstorming, I have some specific doubts. <laughs> the first is, we talk about state, but what is the state in this digital context? Uh, is still the state that we know in the tradition? Because the state that used Palantir to provide basic services, it seems quite different from me from the traditional state that we know before. Um, I, I don't see this in, in a system in which we have a, a lot of combination between public and private entities. Uh, the state that leave to a company to manage and to organize a smart cities is still a state. Uh, so um, the first question is who is the state? And the second point is uh, who represents the state uh, in the digital context? Uh, we, some of you refer to, to, to minority. I didn't remember who referred to minority. Uh, maybe you in your presentation. Um, and so uh, what is the state in the digital uh, context? Uh, the state is uh, the top-down uh, administration or that uh, creates the digital life for the citizen organizing any step of the life. The state is the state that creates a participation inclusive to, uh, approach but driving towards one direction or another because participation is a nice uh, instrument in order <laughs> to manipulate the people sometimes. And uh, so this, I think, uh, is a, a bit... Uh, if, is this still the state as we know in the Westphalian order, or is something different, something hybrid, hybrid, sorry, is something that uh, uh, is, not, is crossed to the category that we have traditionally also in constitutional and private law? And uh, if uh, this is the situation, what are the answer? The answer is uh, uh, reconsidering the role of the state, the nature, of the state, the nature of the agreement among the cities that lead to the state. And so these are some ideas. So open to your reaction and to other ideas that uh, during these few minutes, also the audience are uh, just uh, preparing their minds for us. <laughs> Is expected a sort of reaction. <laughs> no, yes. <laughs> 
What's the protocol we reply? No, we we we, we 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 reply to these general comments and then we leave that to the to the audience for a specific question, so the audience has time to to think about some question. Okay. And we'll someone want to reply if not to get you. By order of appearance, then. My my answer is fairly short, actually. Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, my answer is fairly short because my thoughts started from the traditional state. So we're looking at the nation state enlarged maybe by supranational orders, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but when I pointed out that there is public-private partnership, that's where it's starting at the corners to become a fuzzy concept because all of a sudden the power, if that's what you're looking for, and, and there I disagree with, uh, with Vagelis. I really like the theory of, of the state being a trusted person, and it links immediately to my concept of the state having to arrange for areas where conflict can be solved, which is pretty much in, in sync, I think, there. But um, what, you, what you need is sort of the entity as such. And my perspective is still very traditional. And although we've had this discussion of transformation of the state going on for 20 years now, I still see it as the states and the United Nations. It's still the states use legislation, so unless and I don't see the private actors uh, contradicting that. They're not taking up another sort of legislation or something. They're acting. They're creating law by action. And it's back to code is law or, or um, the other way around. But we still have the states as being the ones who have prime access to legislation, prime access to courts, prime actions to enforcement, et cetera, et cetera. And therefore, I'd say that's one of the questions where I'd be, and this is where I contradict Vagelis, where we can actually start from what we have and don't really need to think about totally new concepts um, because we don't see that there's a dissolution. I see that in different topics, but that's not what, if I look around, most of the people here are probably addressed, and that is the power of money. If you have NGOs who are able to um, present good deeds into a country which exceed the country's um, national budget, then that changes power, but it doesn't change the state. It changes who has the power. Thank, thank you for this reaction. J just a quick comment. Uh, uh, what about the situation in which uh, the local administration created smart cities and the smart cities rule that uh, are about the organization of the life of the cities uh, are set by a private company that are also role and power in order to interact directly with the citizen in order to organize their life, because this is what happened. So uh, I agree that the state is still there uh, to a large extent, we can say. But it's also true that there is a sort of privatization of many functions of the state uh, to, to um, um, different kinds of system in which are private companies that exercise typical state actor functions. In, in moderating, in organizing, and shaping society. So I, I think uh, <laughs> this is an issue, <laughs> I think. Just a quick answer. So what, we've had that. We've had arbitration, we've had um, ISO and DEAN standards, we've had external knowledge integrated into the state, we've had the state um, basically develop some sort of delegated power to the privates. I don't see that as a fundamental problem. Shifts, Never yes. Changed. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay. Any other comments? Um, all right. I, I, I just want to very briefly uh, pick up on this, <coughs> this categorization of what I said as some kind of answer. So there's context and there's answer, and there's actually something in between, which for me is description. I, I, I'm not a philosopher, but I very much like this, this, uh, this approach of a French philosopher, Deleuze, who says the... The aim of philosophy is the palpation of difference and the, the, the bringing up of new descriptions for the unfolding of the world. And that's what I saw as an effort here. It's, that's what I saw as the idea of an interface, right? To describe some difference that we saw unfolding that we didn't have before, that we can use then to build on. Um, and I just also want to try and point out a slight difference. I, I said it was a novel concept, and you brought back the idea of an enabling right. We have some other similar concepts. So uh, risk orientations to data protection, very similar. Uh, procedural approaches to data protection, very similar. I want to just very much highlight that from my perspective, mm -hmm. and I, I appreciate that this could be wrong. Um, my perception is that we tend to have taken the underlying fundamental rights 
as these monoliths, that we knew what they were and they were clear and we were just sort of unpacking them. Like there's this old German term, Begriffsjurisprudenz, where law said everything already, we're just finding out what it said. Um, and I wanna highlight the idea behind this concept of interface is not, not the, that we're unpacking a pre-existing defined set of fundamental rights, but that what we're doing is we're finding out what they might be via data protection. And uh, with that, I'd probably pass on to Laura after trying to defend myself. <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> thank you so much, Dara, and thank you so much, Alessandro, for uh, this uh, interesting question. I would say that uh, this state is one that uh, recognizes these asymmetry of power and asymmetry of information as well, and the need for a dialogue with the private sector, and which explains a lot uh, why it has to use these new techniques, these new instruments, uh, such as this uh, impact assessment, such as these uh, almost a negotiated regulation as some of uh, uh, some of American scholars uh, call call it so I think it's it's a state that recognizes um, these asym asymmetries but uh, on the other hand uh, it is a state that now um, knows that it must take this power and really regulate so all, uh, even if it's, if it's in another way even if it's with other instruments. So as Luciano Florigi uh, tells us, uh, the era of self-regulation is, is gone. So I think, uh, or maybe <laughs> should be. And I think it, uh, it is also recognized that it sh should um, uh, act, but maybe in some different ways. Just, just a quick comment about Luciano Floridi. Uh, just to remember that for many years it was a support and strong supporter of ethics and soft regulation and company driven regulation also actively collaborating in this kind of operation. I'm very happy that you recently after the final stage of the AI Act is changing his mind, but I think it's not exactly a championship <laughs> in this field as many other in this uh, conference were over the last years. <laughs> No, with me, it's the same as Dara. It is a, it's a description, it's a model. I did not intend to... I'm very much in favor of uh, state and its role. It uh, states as platform and individuals as seeking to maximize information, not that it, that, uh, that by seeking to process. Uh, it's just a model. It is not intended to do anything, just to explain things. So to explain what has been happening and why this thing suddenly changed why suddenly control that was taken as a given now somehow is challenged and why the state attacks back in trying to deglobalize the internet and install servers in Europe or servers in Italy or uh, the, you know, the, and then China has its own, Russia has its own. So we're trying to, why, why the pushback? So I'm, I'm only giving a model to explain this. I'm not yet, yet at least. <laughs> Because then you have to explain the EU. It's it's it's, it's a process, but uh, no, it's a, it's a description. It's not something. From the floor, any question, please. Okay, this is a micro piece. Make a, a line. <laughs> I'm sorry, but uh, is the local. Good afternoon. I'm Renato Sabadini with VUB. It's a very interesting panel. Uh, I had one comment for Professor Speaker. Um, I found the, the presentation very interesting. I think it falls perfectly in line with the, the definition of free will that uh, Daniel Dennett gave uh, once at a conference, which is uh, at the core, in its most practical sense, free will is our ability to maintain a margin of unpredictability of us, of ourselves, and our actions vis a vis others. So, of course, if uh, an infrastructure is created which makes it possible for make every our action predictable, then, of course, in a sense, we do lose free will. And to Professor uh, Constantino, Papa Constantino, I wanted to ask, uh, in this model where the state is a intermediary of uh, a mediator, an informational mediator or intermediary, uh, 
Do you think we could explain also the collapse of states in the past, like uh, like uh, Western Roman Empire, in terms of the inability of a state at a certain point to no longer handle the amount uh, uh, of information that it needs to handle? Thank you. We collect the, the, the question oh. and then we provide it on the answer after this. So mine's actually a bit connected to that one, so maybe it's easier for me to pro propose my question now. Because um, I'm not a historian or philosopher, so this might not be a true argumentation as well. I understand where this comes from, the state being the inform, uh, information broker or like inter information intermediary throughout the history, but I'm not really sure if it applies to the whole history that we share because let's say I don't think Marco Polo was actually traveling with his passport. And actually I'm not really sure where that uh, argumentation leads us because that's also one of the rhetoric even today that uh, some of the states are actually using to prevent, for instance, same-sex marriages or like women to preserve their surname when they get married because they say that, yeah, the state has the duty to keep the archives and uh, we need to know like the parentage and all those kind of issues. So I'm not denying the fact, but I'm not quite sure if we put it as the priority of the state and we say that yeah, we always had the name and nationality. I'm not quite sure where it might lead us. But as I understand, like, you know, totally understand where does it come from, and that's why we have the data protection in the first stage, but that was my uh, concern when I was listening. Um, thank you for the presentations and just having very different thoughts to take away at the very close of this conference. We were speaking about post-Westphalian order, um, and particularly, I think, Indra and Pelagos, I apologize if I have your names wrong at all, but um, your models both speak about limitations of the state versus multinational actors versus their own power and their citizens. I'm curious um, how a case like um, TikTok with close ties to the Chinese Communist Parties complicates that picture. Is it something that exists on the spectrum of something that is a natural outflow of this Westphalian model, that, of this post-Westphalian model, or is it a new form of more traditional type of war, or is it just some other entity, if you were drawing up your taxonomy of new entities in this universe and their powers? Thank you for the interesting panel. I was uh, most provoked by the, uh, by the phrase that uh, the name and the nationality is given to individuals by the state. Um, and I would like to probe that a bit further with a, with a short but fundamental question. Um, is the name really created by the state and given to the individual, uh, the, the name and also other attributes of an identity? Or is the identity formed by the individual and then recognized either correctly or incorrectly by the state? And in cases of uh, disagreement between the individual and the state, who is wrong? <laughs> Okay, I think uh, we have some question. You can pick the question uh, that you prefer and you are not that to address all necessary. So we follow this order that is the opposite at the beginning, <laughs> almost. Okay, I can start uh, the last question. If there is a doubt, then the state uh, records will prevail. I mean, if there was some. So the name and the nationality, yes, they're given by the state. And then it's ratified and it follows. And if you want to change, you have to change the state record. So. And it has been so also in the past when there was no re record, but for military and taxation purposes, there always was some identification, state or yes. Um, as regards TikTok, I really do not know. It is a challenge to the traditional notion of the state. Um, as regards Marco Polo, he was traveling under a very specific state uh, passport and yeah. authority, very formally, and uh, to, a, to a very specific state too. Still very specific, an empire, but still a state. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, and uh, yeah, the same is uh, as before is the, the reply on where would that lead us? I do not know it's a model. So if it leads to uh, violation of human rights, God forbid it or uh, what, uh, this is a model. So information processing by the states, it's, it's not something yet to give uh, solutions. And uh, as regards the Roman, uh, the Roman Empire collapse, I do not know, probably it's that, but I'll end and close this with uh, an example. When the Venetians left Crete to the Ottomans, mm -hmm. 
the deal was that they take the state, the records with them. It was on paper, I don't know what it was, but the deal with the Ottomans is, was that we, st we take the state records of Crete with us, because in the back of their heads, they would reconquer. Conquest by the Ottomans came after a hundred years war, and the, the Venetians said, it will be ours in the future, and we need the state records. So they took the state records with them. It is very important. And when there is an occupation of a new country, then state records are occupied. This is why we have data protection, etc., etc. So I'm done with this. Those it's so very quickly as well uh, regarding TikTok. Um, I think, and that connects with my presentation. I think there are some old concepts that are coming back, such as digital sovereignty. I was talking about it with Alessandro Mantelero. And I'm going to pose the question back. Uh, are these concepts, these old and classical concepts, um, still fit? Uh, or could they be adapted to this new order? So uh, that's uh, much more a question than an answer. Um, thanks a lot for, for uh, the remark, it's really great, and I would like to ask you, we'll do that later, what the exact name of the person was so that I can look him up. Um, the TikTok thing is um, yes and no. The question is great, but um, TikTok China is not a democracy, so all I said is not applicable to them. And um, therefore, what you raise, however, which I left out deliberately, was the multi... Um, border problem that we have, that TikTok is worldwide, but China is just China. And so we have a state which, and this is also a simplification, offers a service through a private entity, makes use of certain data there, blah, 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 um, in order to influence democracies. And you can play that with social bots, with Telegram, with anything. Um, and your question, is that war or not? Maybe it is, yes. Um, I'm not an expert on, on public law, public international law. Um, I think that's the big problem of the democracies and that has little to do with our panel here and that's more personal than, than a legal um, professional opinion that we are in a transitional phase of highly geopolitical change and that the Western world has not really understood that, and that we are all still very petty in our little Italy, Greece, Germany, France, and whatever, um, and that the outsiders are just observing this and just saying, how stupid can you be? <laughs> and um, I think, and, and that's part of my research, and that's where it all comes back to, is that the democracies in this world, and also those states who thrive to become democracies, they all share the belief in exactly that, the dignity of the individual, the participation of the ability to share in the creation of the world that we live in, rather than being a victim to something and to someone. And we're not very good in selling that story presently because we have linked, and again, that's my personal opinion, uh, democracy a little bit too much to capitalism and to economic stability. Um, and if we make people understand that this is nice if it goes hand in hand, but that democracy does not necessarily guarantee that, and that's again my story about taking risks and sometimes even losing, that might be helpful for the strengthening of it. Okay, um, I think the questions were mostly directed at the other panelists, but I wanted to highlight a point. Vajalis, I think you didn't emphasize enough, if I understand your model correctly which is it offers a really nice way of putting lots of different things on a comparable footing. If you talk about information, all of a sudden you have a way that you can talk about states, platforms, et cetera, et cetera, in a very, very similar way. You harmonize the base term of reference and you can talk about them in a different way. And I did have a question for you. In terms of legal theory, what direction, oh, okay. <laughs> what direction or what sort of uh, directions would you suggest in legal theory would best fit your model of states as intermediaries. So for example, I'm, I immediately thought of Kelsen. You put everything on the, <laughs> you put everything on this sort of harmonized framework and you talked about the, the shifting barriers. I thought, well, okay, this is, this is very much back to Kelsen's initial, you know, lack of real significant differentiation between private and public law. And uh, I wondered what your thoughts would be on that. Quickly, because you have to finish, say the guys no, in the first room. Now, sign and it's uh, it's asphyxiating me, so I will not reply. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I like Kelsen very much. Yes, it's obvious. Uh, no, I will not reply. Let's keep it for next year. 
<laughs> Just a quick uh, conclusion. I think that uh, we start with an historical uh, reference and we conclude with an historical reference. Uh, so TikTok, uh, it remember mid uh, commercial companies, the West Indian company, etc. that there are something that uh, in the between the state and the business. And as for the Roman Empire, the Roman Empire didn't fall due to the information. There's a l huge historical debate about <laughs> why the Roman Empire falls. But one interesting theory is that it falls because it was not able to control technology, or much better, was not interesting to develop technology. So I think that we can conclude that uh, the way in which the state relates with technology is also an essential element for the life of the state itself, like in the Roman Empire. Thank you. Bye.